you. That was very nice. Thank you very much for being here. This is incredible. Uh, I am trying to get it together for all of you. Uh, I just went back to the dentist for the first time in three years for this, so needless to say, he was not thrilled with what I'd been up to with my own adult mouth in my off time. I feel like, personally, there's too much guilt at the dentist. They lay it on heavy. I thought, as I got older, it would go away, but this is not true. Doesn't matter how old you get. Every time you go into the dentist, he's like, you didn't do your dentist homework, did ya? <laughs> I feel like the guilt is not needed. I also don't know if dentists know they're the only ones doing this. <laughs> Other medical professionals, it does not happen to the same degree. When I go to the optometrist, if my eyesight gets worse, he's not like, what were you doing? Were you looking? <laughs> Quit looking so hard. <laughs> and brush your eyes or something. <laughs> like if anything, my optometrist is too blasé. Every time I go in there, he's like, you could drive without your glasses. <laughs> if you want. I'm like, I don't want to. He's like, come on, do it, you coward. <laughs> do it at night. Let me follow you and film it. <laughs> There's an expression I love to describe an attractive person, which is to say that they are easy on the eyes. Something, it's an old timey expression. People say that, take a look at them, they're easy on the eyes. It means they're hot, right? And I love this expression because it comes with the implication that unattractive people are hard on our eyes. That can't have ever been true. That's never come up at the eye doctor. I've never gone in, he's like, again, we need to strengthen your prescription. Who are you looking at? Quit going to Walmart. <laughs> you have got to stop watching so much British television. <laughs> we can only make the glass so thick, you know. <laughs> but I do feel like I'm getting my life together. Uh, I got married. I did that. I have a wife. Thank you. I got married and I love it. I think it's fantastic. I think if you're thinking about doing it, do it. It's great. So far, it is a lot of being asked to retrieve something <laughs> by someone who is closer to that thing than you. <laughs> so if there's not enough of that in your life, tie the knot. You get to have a lot of conversations about geometry post-matrimony. Yes, I'd love to get you that thing, but I just want you to understand that if I were to draw a line, from where I am now to the object you've requested, that line would go through you. <laughs> In order to complete your request, I'm going to have to walk toward you, arrive at your location, say excuse me to you, and then complete my quest. But we'll do it, right? Because that's love or whatever. <laughs> and if you are a purist, you should know that when I proposed, I did the whole thing, all right? I bought a ring, I spent six months' salary, that's right, four hundred dollars. <laughs> Great financing plans at Claire's. <laughs> They'll tell you they don't have store credit, but if you return enough stuff, they have to give it to you. <laughs> no, it was expensive. I was nervous spending this much on a, a diamond, on a jewel. I don't really do that. I didn't come from money. I'm from a small town, the kind of town where if a farmer grew a really big pumpkin, we didn't have to go to school. <laughs> that was the vibe in our town. School's closed, come look at it. <laughs> look how big it is. Go ahead, slap it. <laughs> she could take it. <laughs> yeah, we didn't have money. I did not know that we didn't have money because Instagram had not been invented yet. <laughs> I feel like it was a lot easier to hide your income from your children in the 90s, right? All you had to do is move to a neighborhood where everybody made the same amount of money as you. And you got to be like, go ride your bike around. This is as good as it gets. <laughs> Don't go over that bridge. 
I got no idea. The only way I found out that we were not as wealthy as I thought was the first time I went over to a slightly richer family's house for Thanksgiving, and we all sat on the same kind of chair. <laughs> I was blown away. I was like, you've got 11 of this one chair type? Are you secretly a duke of some sort? Like every holiday meal in my house would be like, Ivan, go get the computer chair for grandma. <laughs> I'm dragging it down the hall. I wanted the computer chair. <laughs> my mom's yelling out of the kitchen. No chance. You are sharing the piano bench with your brother. <laughs> and you know it. We didn't have a piano, by the way. It's just the bench. <laughs> My uncle's at the end of the table, sitting on a yoga ball. <laughs> Got a hole in it, nobody can find, so he's slowly sinking for the entire meal. And I was like, I don't think we're as rich as I thought. So this was a problem, of course, when it came to buying a diamond ring. I didn't know anything about it. I knew I had to go to a jewelry store. I knew that I was going to interact with a commission salesperson at that store, which I was nervous about, because I'm uncomfortable around commissioned salespeople. I'm very easily bamboozled <laughs> by their tricks. I'm sure you can all tell this from my general vibe. <laughs> Anybody watching this that works in sales, as soon as I walked up here, thought to themselves, this guy buys extended warranties. <laughs> I know what I look like. I don't exactly know the kind of energy I give off on a first impression. I do know that it means if I go to any type of ethnic restaurant, it is a 100% guarantee that I will be cautioned about spice. <laughs> it's not easy getting a medium with this face. <laughs> yeah, I have a medium. No, you won't. Not here, you won't. <laughs> you had our medium? I doubt it. Guy looked like you got a medium yesterday. We had to call an ambulance. <laughs> so you can have a mild and a milk. <laughs> There's a lot of things I wish I knew going into this jewelry store. Number one thing I wish I knew about buying an engagement ring is you don't get to take the ring home from the store that day. Whoops, wish I knew that. They gotta make it the right size. So I just drove to the mall, maxed out my credit card, and then drove home with nothing. Like, gee, I sure hope they call. <laughs> they did call, I got lucky, I guess. I go back to pick up the ring. This is where it gets weird again. I show up, I was like, hi, my name's Ivan. You said my ring was ready? And the guy goes, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> then he goes in the back, he comes out. He's got the ring in a tiny Ziploc bag, like it was evidence <laughs> in a murder. <laughs> And he tried to hand it to me like that. I didn't even accept it. And he goes, oh, do you need a box? <laughs> yeah. Who's proposing without the box? That's the whole thing. How smooth of a guy do you think I am that I'm gonna kneel down and just dangle that out there like, babe! <laughs> you wanna stay together till we're dead? <laughs> They wrote my name on here in pen. <laughs> Could be your name. <laughs> but no, she said yes. Uh, we had a wedding. It was great. Thank you. I will tell her you clapped. She planned most of it. I helped, all right? I helped with the registry, which is harder than you think. Putting together a wedding registry is tough, right? You gotta be careful about what you put on your wedding registry. Can't put anything too expensive on there. Or your friends will be like, who? Did they think they uh? And you also can't put anything too cheap on there because you are definitely getting that for sure. <laughs> Especially if you are friends with comedians, I found out. <laughs> we got one dishcloth from a couple. Do you understand? <laughs> they pooled their resources to send us a single dishcloth which I did not scan any single dish cloths. I scanned a three pack. They somehow found a way to get one out of there and have it mailed to us with their regards. And my wife, very traditional, she's like, you need to send them a thank you card. I was like, I think the stationery for the thank you card is gonna cost more than this dish cloth. I'm gonna write it on the dish cloth. Get me a Sharpie, that's what I'm gonna do. 
He's like, you have to do it. So I'd be like, fine. Dear Darcy and Jeremy, thank you so much for sending us one dishcloth. We sure hope it comes up in rotation when you are at our home. Oh, should the fates align in such a way, what a day that will be. And then, of course, there are people that reject the idea of a registry altogether, right? Even if you send one out, they will not pay attention to it. Usually, this person is your aunt. I don't know why. Everybody has one aunt that looks at a wedding registry and goes, oh, you have a registry? Yeah, I'm just gonna buy you a plate that is too big for any cupboard on earth. <laughs> yes, I would like one of your kitchen cabinets to remain slightly ajar. <laughs> for the rest of your lives. Blessings and prosperity upon you. <laughs> we did get one off-registry gift, though, that we loved. We thought this was a very clever idea. We like wine, so a friend of ours put together for us a box of three nice bottles of wine and then labeled them for upcoming life events. So, like, the first bottle was first New Year's, second bottle, first anniversary, and then the third bottle was first fight. <laughs> Pretty good, right? Pretty cute. The only issue I had was that the first fight wine was a white, which means that it has to be chilled. <laughs> so this means during the fight, I gotta be like, is this the fight? Because I gotta put the wine in the fridge. I don't know, it feels like you're ramping up. You got another 20 minutes in you, or what do you think? We don't want to drink hot fight wine. But no, we get along very well. I am extremely lucky, of course. My wife, she's a fantastic cook too, which is a huge bonus for me. I don't know how to cook, I never learned. I should have. My mom tried to teach me growing up. I was arrogant about it. I was like, I don't need to learn this now. I know where the grocery store is. I'll figure it out when I'm an adult. And then I tried to do that and realized that is impossible because if you don't know how to cook, you also don't know how to shop because foods are not together in the grocery store. The grocery store is a place where someone has disassembled foods and hid the pieces all over a building. I gotta wander around a warehouse trying to reverse engineer tacos from memory. So like I could cook, but it would just be worse. And that's no good for anybody because groceries cost the same regardless of your skill level. I found that out as well. I can't cut a deal with the butcher. Like, listen, I'm gonna ruin these steaks, I promise. <laughs> We're talking brown all the way through. I don't know how to make them pink in the middle. I've never seen it. Anybody you could knock a couple of bucks off? But no, there's no such thing as training steaks. So my wife cooks. And in exchange, I do the dishes. I'm told this is a very common arrangement with successful couples, right? Cook people love bringing it up. If you're not gonna cook, you gotta do the dishes. That's fair, that's even, that's the trade. And while I am willing to do the dishes, I do not agree that this is an even trade. <laughs> now I know there are dish people in this room right now that are hesitant to get on board with me because you are sitting with the cook person in your life. <laughs> and that is fine, stare straight ahead quietly. I'll say what needs to be said. <laughs> dishes sucks, all right, cooks? Sucks the whole time. It's not satisfying or fulfilling. There's no fun new dish recipes that we get to try. And it's even worse doing the dishes for someone who is cooking and knows that they will not be doing the dishes. Because this causes them to use every possible dish. I'll just put this mustard into a little bowl and then I'll put it in the pan. Just take it out of the jar and put it in the pan. For God's sake, run the spoon under some water for three seconds. Instead of just gluing it to the countertop. There you go, it lives there now. Get that off in the morning with a butter knife. Dishes is awful, right? It's what they threaten you with at a restaurant if you can't pay your bill. They don't mention the police. They're like, you're gonna have to do dishes, the worst thing in the world. Cooking's not even close. People love cooking, right? They devote their lives to it. There's entire TV shows where they watch other people do it. Every single one of those shows, they put a camera in their face. What are you gonna do if you win the cooking cook contest? And they all go, I'm gonna buy a restaurant so I can cook all the time. I love cooking. <laughs> there is not one show 
devoted to dishes. We don't get a show. There's no show called Scrubbed. I'm like, all right, under this cloth, there's a bunch of dirty dishes. You can use any kind of sponge you want. Everybody ready? It's all cast iron pans. My wife cooks, is what I'm telling you. And uh, I, I'm the snack man, all right? I love snacks, I love choosing snacks, I like offering snacks, I like eating snacks. I like all snacks. I do have a favorite snack. I do think the top snack in the world is popcorn. Popcorn's number one. It is on top, in my opinion, because of its versatility. First of all, you do anything with popcorn. Whatever mood you're in, popcorn's got you covered, right? You can put cheese on it, caramel, we take a left into Savory Town, or you can drive down the road to Sweetville. Popcorn's riding shotgun the whole time. You don't even have to eat it. You can put it on a string for a wedding in a trailer park. I believe that popcorn is so good that it's the reason why we all have microwaves. Because they're not good at anything else. General Electric should be digging up Orville Redenbacher and kissing him on the lips every weekend. He sold every microwave in rotation today. If you think I'm lying, go look at a microwave. What does the top left button say? Yeah, it says popcorn, all right? It's above the numbers. Do you understand? They're like, don't do math. That's for burritos. We know why you're here. <laughs> microwave popcorn was incredible. It changed the game. And I think the reason why microwave popcorn was so successful is because some people in this audience may be old enough to remember what it was like to make popcorn at home before the microwave. Yeah, it was like cooking meth. It was insane. It was quite literally the most dangerous thing you could do on a residential property. Parents would be like, get the kids out of the kitchen. I'm making popcorn out here. Turn their faces away from the oil. By the way, I'm pretty sure our insurance doesn't cover this. So uh, if anything goes wrong, uh, I was baking a pie, a corn pie. You all saw me. <laughs> but we were willing to do it, because popcorn's incredible. Now, I know there are people that disagree with me. They say, I mean, popcorn can't be number one, because it gets stuck in your teeth. And yes, it does get stuck in your teeth, and that feels bad, but that bad feeling is offset by how good it feels when you finally get it out of there. <laughs> so popcorn, back on top, number one. In fact, now I love that it gets stuck in your teeth, because now, you've just postponed a good feeling for later on. And who among us couldn't use that in these dark, uncertain times? <laughs> Think about it, eat a bowl of popcorn, you watch your favorite movie, everything's going great, but then the movie's too long. You stayed up too late, it's a work night, oh no. I don't have time to brush my teeth, I gotta go right to bed. So you go to bed, you put your phone away, you turn the light out. Now the only light left in the room is your digital clock. Why do you still have one? You don't know, but there it is. <laughs> Floating in the dark, taunting you with how little sleep you're gonna get. If only you couldn't do math at this hour, but you can. Your brain keeps running the numbers and it keeps coming up short. <laughs> and for some reason, this wakes you up more. I don't know why our minds do this. They're like, I am not gonna get enough sleep. How can I sleep at a time like this? <laughs> I better stay as awake as possible and rapidly categorize all possible future failings. <laughs> and as your thoughts begin to collide with the jagged edge of tomorrow's responsibilities, your tongue begins to explore the crevices of your teeth. And all of a sudden you make contact with that old familiar kernel skin lodged in your back molar. You forgot it was there, now it's all you can focus on. And you wish for a second that your tongue had an ounce more dexterity. Oh, if only I could come at it from another angle, but you can't. All you can do is push feebly on it in the same direction you already tried 30 times prior. You think, I'll get my finger involved. Finger is the master of dexterity. Finger will help. Finger can't help. Finger can't even find it. <laughs> hopelessly lost, keep touching it with the end of your tongue. It's right there, finger! <laughs> Next, you try to help your stupid finger by counting your own teeth. <laughs> like a lunatic. How many do I even have? Okay, it's three back. Go, finger, go! <laughs> but this doesn't work. You have to abandon your dumb hand altogether. 
Just when you think all hope is lost, just when you're dangling over the event horizon of permanent despair, you reach down deep, give it one more push. What the hell, why not? But this time it's different. This time it moves a little bit. New hope springs eternal. You give it a couple more pushes and it flies free. Oh, do you spit it out? Not yet. First, it's time for a tiny celebration inside your mouth. First thing you do is put the kernel skin onto the end of your tongue like a little hat. And then you slide it in between your top and bottom front teeth and give it a bunch of tiny, tiny bites. As it disintegrates, you receive a rush of serotonin and dopamine that is better than drugs. What other snack does that? Oh, thank you. And thank you to everybody that did the tiny little bites along with me. I saw you. Now, my favorite thing about popcorn, though, definitely has to be, there is no way anybody knew corn was gonna do that. Like, before there was popcorn, no one could have guessed that that was gonna happen. You could have taken the smartest person in the world, made them look at a cob of corn, and be like, hey, what do you think happens if you let this dry out and then heat it up? They certainly wouldn't have gone, I bet each kernel explodes only a little bit into a delicious soft snack you could put in a bowl. Nobody knew that. That would have been an insane guess, which means the popcorn must have been discovered by accident, and why don't we know that story? Where's that Netflix documentary? Why the hell did we all have to watch Tiger King? I want to know who found popcorn. I don't know how it went down. I have to imagine, I guess it was a family somewhere, procured some corn cared for it inappropriately. <laughs> the young son had to deliver the news. <laughs> Papa. <laughs> He's probably taller. Papa. <laughs> the corn is too dry. <laughs> we cannot eat it. This is a shame, son. Well, at least we won't freeze to death. Throw it on the fire. One to three minutes later. <laughs> Hi, you're never gonna believe this. What's happening? No time to explain. Bring cheese, caramel, it doesn't matter. <laughs> now, but I do love all snacks almost as much as I love popcorn. What I don't love is uh, healthy people coming for snacks, right? They came for our meals and we let them. <laughs> and now they're coming for snacks and I don't think that's appropriate, all right? Snacks are a reward for eating healthy the rest of the time. I eat three gross meals I do not enjoy. And then at 11 o'clock at night, three bags of chips and a bowl of ice cream. That's how we do it. <laughs> now they want us to be healthy. Like you have healthy snacks on hand. I don't even know what that is. I had to ask, I was like, what? What are the healthy snacks I should have? And they told me it's nuts, Ivan. You forgot about nuts, didn't you? Probably because they're illegal in every elementary school. <laughs> You know that if you're an adult, you can just go get nuts. It's not even that hard. You just need money. They're in the grocery store, I found out, next to the chips, which I think is a bad spot. Because then you are forced to see, by comparison to chips, how expensive nuts are. I had no idea. A bag of chips is like $2, and it's the size of my pillow. You know how much $2 worth of nuts is? Three and a half almonds. That's not enough for a snack. I remember the first time I saw the price on a bag of pistachios, and I remember it very clearly because it shattered my brain. I was like, I can't believe I've ever had one of these. I've never been in a Ferrari. How have I had a pistachio? These shouldn't be in my life. So I thought, if I'm gonna do this, if I'm gonna break the bank on these snack nuts, I wanna go all the way to the top. I want the biggest bang for my nut buck. I want the healthiest possible nuts. So I asked them what it was. I said, what's the healthiest one? I'll just start there. And they said, it's walnuts, Ivan. Everybody knows that. And I said, I don't think anybody knows that. They said, yeah, walnuts are incredible. They are so healthy, you can eat as many walnuts as you want. And I said, wow, that is great news. Because I'm actually already doing that. Zero, they're gross. <laughs> 
Walnuts are disgusting. If you don't believe me, eat a walnut and tell me if it's gone bad. You don't know, no one does. Every single time I have eaten a raw walnut, I'm like, nope, those are off, call the hospital. I just opened the bag, really? Because I think I just ate a spider covered in wood. That's what that tasted like. Is that what it was a bag of? Like, you can tell walnuts are bad because they're never the main flavor of anything. You never see a product advertise flavor, walnut. <laughs> Furniture only is when that happens. <laughs> if it's in food, it's always like, maple walnut. And let's be honest, maple is going to be doing the heavy lifting. <laughs> This happens too much in the food world, I think. They'll take a bad food and try to pair it up with something better to try to sneak it into our lives. I think it needs to stop. The most egregious example of this, of course, is cinnamon raisin. Why are those two still together? If I was Cinnamon's PR manager, I'd be like, break up with raisin immediately. You're Cinnamon, kid, you're a star. Everyone loves you. You can make it to the top on your own. Stop being seen in public with Raisin! Like, all Raisin is doing is dragging down Cinnamon's image. People are afraid of Cinnamon things because they think Raisin might be there. Would you like a Cinnamon bun? I don't know. Will Raisin be in attendance? That's the worst place to find a raisin. Is it a cinnamon bun? When you least expect it? Ugh, it's terrible. Ruins your whole day. Because not only are they gross, they also do not cool down at the same speed as the rest of the bun. It's a safety concern. I don't understand how raisins manage to maintain the specific heat capacity of the center of a star. Anytime you take a cinnamon bun with raisins in it out of the oven or microwave, depending on your life choices, you can wait 20 minutes. I think it's ready to eat. No, it is not. There are seven wrinkled balls of lava waiting for you. I will never understand how cinnamon and raisin got together in the first place. Yes, I'm still talking about this. Must have been a bad breakup. That's the only thing that makes sense. I've thought a lot about it. I think cinnamon got dumped by brown sugar, probably. <laughs> Just wandering the streets one night. It's standards impossibly low. I'll never find a more perfect pairing. <laughs> and then some shriveled up creep came around the corner. <laughs> hey. I used to be a grape, you know. <laughs> you wanna go ruin some cookies? <laughs> oh. There will definitely be more snacks in my life coming up because uh, my wife and I just had a baby. Uh, so we have a child now. <laughs> Thank you very much. Another thing I recommend, you know, if you think about doing it, go ahead, do it. It's great. Another gift opportunity, too. People buy you stuff when you have a baby. People bought us a lot of gifts, a lot of books, too many books, I think. They were like, here's some books for the baby. I was like, baby, you can't read. They are like, they're for you. I was like, they're a bit slow for me. I like a durable cardboard book as much as the next guy, but not a lot of depth of character. How did those dogs become in charge of that fire station? I will never know. I do think that we, as a society, are putting far too much emphasis on teaching babies which barnyard animal makes which noise. <laughs> we got like 11 books with this information in it. They're like, oh, he's born? Get this in his brain right away. This is the first thing he needs to know for planet Earth. Very important. I don't think it's that important, all right? I would rather have a book with a list of hot and sharp things. That'd be much more useful. <laughs> right now. I don't think this barnyard stuff is gonna come up. In fact, I know it's not gonna come up because I had those books as a kid. I've been to a farm. You get to see the animal before it makes the sound. You can pick it up pretty quick on the fly. 
I don't think anyone out there is being asked to blind identify a barnyard animal solely based on its call. How would that even come up? You get locked in a barn accidentally? There's a knock at the door. Who is it? Oink, oink. I forget. I think it's a chicken. Don't open it. But no, of course, the best thing about having uh, a baby is you get to watch your parents become grandparents, which is very exciting and also ridiculous because every parent that becomes a grandparent behaves like someone that has just been rehired at a company they have not worked at in 35 years. <laughs> and they've decided they need zero additional training. <laughs> Hey, we do other things a little bit different around here. You want to be brought up to speed? No, I know what I'm doing. Get that kid face down. Put a blank in his mouth. He looks cold. What? <laughs> where are you going? I'm going to get my whalebone skin brush. Now, where do you keep your teething rum? All right. You need to watch a PowerPoint before you can take care of this kid. <laughs> it is weird being a parent and a millennial because now I have to be optimistic and that's not really our thing. <laughs> Trying to have hope again. That's not really what we're known for. Our hope. I'm trying to get back on board with hope, right? Trying to wean myself back on. I have a small hope. This hope I have, I hope that at some point in the near future, Clorox makes it to 100% of germs killed. <laughs> Let's get there. They have been stalled at 99.9 .9 for too long. What are you doing down there, Clorox? Put your foot on the gas and finish this thing. <laughs> The things we all learned over the past couple of years, that 0.1%, pretty important. <laughs> I'm not saying it's their fault, but have they applied themselves? <laughs> no, I don't know where my hope is going. Into my phone, probably. That's where it goes. I look at it, I'm like, I feel bad about everything. I do miss, I long for the days of right before smartphones. I feel like that was the peak fun cell phone era, right? 2006, 2007, they were trying to get smart. There were all these weird new phones that came out all the time. They had like a keyboard that slid out of the side. They were all made of plastic. They had little doors in them. A lot of them had an antenna you could pull up for some reason. Like, time for a big call. Why? <laughs> Just make it work all the time. Did that ever save a call? Was it be like, I'm losing you. Hold on. Oh, nope, got you back. Yeah. <laughs> No, I had an extra two and a half inches of antenna in the chamber. <laughs> Crystal clear now. <laughs> but then the iPhone hit, 2008, right? Changed everything. They brought it, they were like, look at this. They came to the mall, they had little kiosks. They're like, this is the phone of the future. It's made out of glass. You know that stuff that breaks? <laughs> yeah, we made the whole phone out of that. So anyway, you drop it. Smash. <laughs> Can you make it not break? No, but when you buy it, we will also sell you a little suit of armor for it that makes it too big to fit in any pants. <laughs> but the big piece of tech that they were so excited about was like, this is what makes it the greatest phone. Is you can hold it like this, and it's a thumb. You can turn it sideways, and you can watch a video, and it knows when you turn it, and it turns on its own. And we were all like, wow. Flash forward to today, anytime my phone turns, I am furious. <laughs> I'm like, why is it turning? Stop turning. I'm in bed. You should know I'm in bed. You know everything about me, phone. <laughs> the first thing they had to do on the next iPhone they released was make it so you could turn off turning. They're like, we're sorry about all the turning. You can change, you can turn turning off now. Turning's turned off, there's a thing, you slide down, no turning. Turning's off, but then you have to remember turning's turned off, because sometimes you try to turn, you're like, hang on, I turned turning off. Yeah. <laughs> then, you gotta, then you gotta slide it down, turn turning on, and then turn it till it knows it's turned. You'd think there'd just be a button to turn it, but no, that's not how it works. You open up the turning, and then turn it till it's aware that it's turned, and then you tilt it too far back, and it goes upside down, you're like, hold on. And that's it, they haven't improved it since then. There's been no, not a lot of new tech coming, no slide out keyboards, no antennae. They moved the headphone jack around a little bit. We had to live through that saga. They were like, it's on the top, it's on the bottom, it's back on top. Then we went, we don't really care where it is. And they went, well then you don't get it anymore. <laughs> Do 
We took it away. Everything comes out of one hole in the bottom now, like a bird. I will tell you what does give me hope. What gives me hope now is seeing other couples out in the world. I love seeing what they're up to. If they're happy, that's great. If they're not doing well, that's also pretty good because it makes you feel good about your own relationship. <laughs> when I see them make mistakes, that's always what blows my mind, right? If it's something good, I can steal. I'm like, great. But if I see a mistake, I see some that I'm like, this blows my mind. The most insane one I've ever seen was I, went, I was in a restaurant and I saw this couple. It was a guy and his wife. And uh, they ordered food, as you do in a restaurant. And when the food landed, the man had ordered a burger and fries. His wife ordered a salad and it arrived and she reached for one of his fries and he moved her hand like, no. And I was like, what are you doing? Are you trying to be the victim on a true crime podcast? How do you not know this rule? That's an insane thing to not know. If you're single watching this, you need to understand that when you enter into a committed relationship, all french fries in your future are communal. <laughs> Like, it should be in the vows. They should be like, do you take this woman to have and to hold a little bit of your fries? <laughs> Till death or a keto diet do your part. <laughs> but stick with it if you're in a relationship, right? It's, it's, I know it's tough, it gets tough sometimes. When my wife and I first started dating, we were in a long distance relationship, which is very difficult, mostly because nobody believes in it. <laughs> The main problem with long distance is everyone's rudeness concerning your relationship. People are very, every, anybody finds out you're long distance, they're like, long distance, that doesn't work, just break up now. And then you're like, can I just order a coffee? I don't know why you're getting involved in this. But we got through that, and I was like, that's it. That's the hardest thing we're gonna have to do. Smooth sailing from here on out. And then the lockdowns happened. And I think that's when a lot of us discovered that the only thing harder than a long distance relationship is a close distance relationship. <laughs> Much more challenging. You get into arguments you did not know you would need to prepare for. Like one day she came into the living room and she was like, did you cut bread on this cutting board? And I said, yes. And she went, this is not the cutting, cutting board. This is the serving cutting board. You're supposed to cut bread on the cutting cutting board and then put it onto the serving cutting board. Now you've made a cut mark on the serving cutting board. It has to get demoted to cutting cutting board and we have to go get a new serving cutting board. And then I had to say, no one's coming over. It's illegal. And then she just walked down the hall picked up the fight wine and put it in the fridge. Thank you very much for coming out tonight, everybody. This means the world to me.